you may find yourself in a space where you think, I have no idea how I got here. Uh, it might be good, and you might go, wow, I love my life. I love my job. I love my family. I love where I live. I love where I go to school. Or it might be challenging, and you might think, how in the world did I end up in this space? Regardless, the Lord has something to do in you. In fact, the question we've been asking over this series isn't, um, how did I get here or why did I get here? But what do I do about it now that I am here? You got it? Okay, last week, Carmen, thank you so much for sharing the word of God with us. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, Carmen took us into a comprehensive deep dive into the book of Esther. Like I was so shocked and surprised and pleased when I listened to the sermon and went, she did the whole book, like everything. It was awesome. And you encouraged everybody to read the book too, because it's a great, great story. But at core, the story is about a woman, a godly woman who found herself in a space where no godly woman would ever ask to be. Um, she was basically taken kind of beyond her own will to be the wife of an evil king. Uh, and not just the wife, one of hundreds of, of women that he had in his harem. And in the middle of having to serve an evil king and an evil system, she ended up being there, not in spite of, not in spite of everything that was going on, but because God had a plan for her. She ended up in that space for such a time as this. Say those words with me. For such a time as this. And we've been looking at that all the way through the Bible. In fact, the first week we talked about Joseph and Joseph ended up in Pharaoh's court for such a time as this. He was able to, while serving an evil king and an evil system, he was able to bring deliverance and salvation to God's people, his family. And then we looked at, um, we looked at Daniel, who also was deported. Joseph was put in prison. He was sold into slavery. Daniel was deported. His city was broken down and burnt down by the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And he was deported to Babylon, made to learn the language and the literature of the Babylonians and what became part of the system of the government in Babylon. But he was a godly man who through five different kings in two different kingdoms was able to bring God's grace and his word and his presence and his life into the middle of a very broken situation. And then last week, Esther. You guys, I know sometimes we feel like we work in an evil place. We live in an evil city. We, we're part of an, an, an evil neighborhood, maybe. You hate your neighbors. Maybe I hope you don't if you're a Christian. But maybe you think, Lord, would you just deliver me from my neighborhood? Everybody around here doesn't love God. Could you just put me in a community where everybody's a Christian and we all get out at five o'clock at night and, and, and grab a guitar and all sit around and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> My Lord, kumbaya, you know, you just want to live in a Christian commune or you go, I hate working at the place that I work because nobody serves God. And Lord, would you just deliver me and put me in a Christian organization where everybody's a Christian? And I believe to that prayer, God often says no, no, because I love you too much. And I love the people that I've called you to be salt and light to too much. And the reason that I have you there on purpose it's not because you did anything wrong. It's not because you messed up your life. I've actually designed your life to be in a space where you can have an influence in the world. Listen, it's not how did I get here? It's God, this is where you have me right now. What do I do about it? What do I do about it? How do I serve you? How do I follow you? How do I know you in this? How do I express your life in this? Sometimes God sends us where we don't want to go. How many of you know that? Sometimes God sends you where you don't want to go, okay? Four of us are in places we don't want to go. Everyone else is exactly where you want to be in life. Uh, maybe you are. Um, uh, today's sermon was going to be on Ruth. And um, I wanted to talk about Ruth and I wanted to talk about grief because a whole lot of us are experiencing grief. Um, if you've been alive in the last couple of years, chances are you've had some kind of grief in your life. The death of a friend or a loved one, um, the death of a dream, um, the death of a job. Um, the death of something. Uh, one psychologist actually talks about ambiguous grief, grief that you can't even put a finger on, but there's something you're grieving inside. And so I spent this week praying about and preparing a message that when I woke up this morning, I clearly hear the Holy Spirit say that message is for next week. Wow. Now, um, that's really cool when the Lord says that. Uh, if you're a preacher and you hear those words, it puts both delight in you because you want to obey the Lord and also a little bit of fear. Because at five o'clock this morning, I thought, well then, Lord, that's great. What am I going to say today? Um, so here I am in front of you. And 
I feel led to share a message with you that's been um, uh, working around my heart that we're, I haven't put together as a sermon yet. And so this isn't a sermon, it's a message. I'm going to put on my professor hat and be Professor Tim today instead of Pastor Tim, and we're going to do a Bible study through Acts chapter 17. But next week, I want, to, I want you to just hear this for a second before we get to Acts 17. Um, next week, we're going to talk about grief. And here's what I really believe. Um, and I believe this is part of why the Lord just is deferring this. For some reason, it's for somebody. Today is for somebody. Today is for, it's all for all of us. But I really believe that somebody who's not here today needs to hear this message next week. And while we have online ability and people can stream online and, and that's great and I love that, there's something also about being in the room. There's a transformational moment being in the room that you can't catch online. And we love you who are watching online. Our hope is you're actually able to watch it with other people because relationship creates transformation. But how many of you in the room right now know that there's something about being present in the room? You know what I'm talking about? And so I want to invite you, if you don't live out of state, out of town, if you're dealing with grief, I want to invite you to be in the room because I think the Lord wants to bring healing next week. I think the Lord wants to bring healing next week. And if you know somebody dealing with grief, I want to encourage you to invite them because I think there's something powerful that's going to happen as we unpack the book of Ruth and find out what do we do when we find ourselves in the middle of grief that we certainly didn't want to get to. Today, though, um, I feel led to talk about uh, Paul in Athens. And um, Athens is a space where Paul ended up after he had been in Philippi. The book of uh, Acts tells us that in Philippi, um, he was going to a place of prayer with a handful of people who had converted to Christianity. And while he was walking to that place, there was a, a, a girl probably a teenager, who made a living for her masters because she was in slavery. She made her living um, being a fortune teller. And she would follow Paul all the way to the place of prayer and yelling out, these men are, the, are, are, are of the most high God. These men are servants of the most high God. These men are servants of the most high God. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like free promotion to me. Like somebody's following you going, these men are servants of the Most High God, listen to them. But Paul knew that this was coming from a spirit that was really broken and messed up. And Paul didn't care as much about what she was saying as he cared about this girl who was bound by something that was totally destroying her. And so eventually he, I think in, uh, even though he did it firmly and boldly, I believe that it came from a heart of compassion to free this girl from the de demon that was binding her, said, come out of her in Jesus' name. And she got freed and delivered, which is really cool. And we celebrate that. Uh, but her masters didn't like that because she was making money for them as a fortune teller. And now that the demon wasn't there anymore, she wouldn't be able to fortune tell. And so they threw Paul and Silas into prison and in prison they beat them up and because they were messing with the economy of the day. How many of you know when you mess with the economy of a, of a city or a situation, that's going to mess people up? You can preach any theology you want, you want to, but when you start getting involved in people's money, that messes people up. And so that's messing people up because they can't make money anymore. They put in Paul and Silas in prison. Paul and Silas are beaten up, but in the middle of the night, they're singing hymns and praise to God. And then an earthquake comes and their chains are loose and they could escape, but they don't. And all the other prisoners and the, and the jailer give their life to the Lord. And it's a great story, but they're kind of run out of town. And they run out of town from Philippi to go to Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica, Paul preaches the gospel. He's there for three weeks and um, the, the, the people that were Jewish people in the area hear this message about a Jewish Messiah. So it wasn't anti-Jewish, folks. As Christians, we're not anti-Jewish. We stand uh, it together with our brothers and sisters that are Jews. But in this context, he's speaking this message and the Jewish people in the city are jealous of Paul because he's gathering more people to him than to themselves. And they end up stirring up the whole city and running them out of town. So Paul and his friends get run out of Thessalonica and they go to Berea. And in Berea, he starts doing the same thing. He starts preaching the gospel and they all come together and they listen to Paul and they check the word of God to see if what he's saying is accurate. But, and everything's going great, but some people from Thessalonica come to Berea and they start spreading rumors and stirring up the city. So now Paul's been to Philippi, to Thessalonica, to Berea, and in all three places, he either gets beaten up, put in jail, or run out of town. 
That sounds like a really great ministry to me, doesn't it? Uh, uh, so Paul's run out of town again and they go, hey, Paul, why don't you give it a rest for a little bit? His friends say, we'll keep doing the ministry where we're doing it. You seem to be uh, attracting a lot of um, pain and a lot of difficulty and challenge. And so we're going to have you go to Athens. Paul didn't plan to go to Athens. It wasn't part of the itinerary, but he ends up in Athens and they drop him off and he's alone in this city of Athens that is a center of art and culture and learning in the ancient Greek world. And we're going to pick this up in Acts chapter 17, verse 16. But before we do, I want to tell you why we're here and why this is a message that's been bouncing around my heart for a few weeks as we've been talking about how did I get here? When we're sent to a place, I believe that the Lord wants to send all of us. He wants to equip us and prepare us to be sent out carrying the ministry and message of Jesus wherever we go carrying the power of the gospel wherever we go, helping people be transformed by an encounter with Jesus through you and I wherever we go. And I believe he's going to send some of us all over the world. Part of the Great Commission was go into all the nations. How many of the nations? All. How many? All. all of the nations. And make disciples wherever you go baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What you saw today needs to happen multiplied thousands of times all over the world. And God's going to use us and he's going to send us. He's going to send us across the city. He's going to send us across the state. He's going to send us across the country. And he's going to send us across the world. But first, we recognize that we are sent to this place. Los Angeles, the San Fernando Valley. Where do you live? Pacoima, um, Chatsworth. Uh, Santa Clarita Valley, Simi Valley, Beverly Hills, Sautel, uh, Santa Monica, Hollywood. And I'm naming names of people that I know go to our church that are living in all of those places, Burbank and Glendale and Pasadena and all over the place. Before God sends you to the next place he has you going, he has already sent you to the place where you are. Can I say that again? Before he sends you to the next place you're going, he's already sent you to the place you are. So those of us who are scrambling to get out, Lord, just send me somewhere, anywhere but here. Send me away from this place. God often will say, let me let you figure it out where you are first before I send you away. Paul is living in Athens for, we don't know if it's days. It's actually more than days because he reasons in the synagogue for at least a few weeks and it might be weeks, it might be months. It's some amount of time where he's stuck in Athens. He didn't plan on getting there, but he figures out how to read the culture of Athens so that he could communicate the gospel to them. And I think there's a template here for those of us who find ourselves living in a culture that might be foreign to us. Some of you may have grown up in a postmodern Los Angeles culture and you understand the culture inherently because it's a culture that you kind of breathe as you grew up. You understand it. You understand the art. You understand the movies. You understand the, the, the poetry. You understand the literature. You understand the way that functions, uh, culture functions. For some of you, you grew up not only in a different location. Maybe you grew up in LA, but you grew up in a different culture. We live in a different culture in 2022 than existed in 1975. How many of you know that? Okay. We live in a different culture, even in the same location in 2022 that existed in 1985 or 1995 or even 2005. We live in the midst of a different culture that we have to learn how to exegete. We have to learn how to understand. We have to learn how to read and speak the language of the people around us so that people might find freedom in the Lord. And that's where we're going to pick this up. And we're going to look at it verse by verse. In verse 16 of Acts 17, it says, While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Now, this city of Athens uh, was a big city. It was a major center for culture and for uh, literature and for poetry and all of that. But one of the major things that happened in Athens was idolatry. In fact, one of the ancient writers, non, not, a, not a, a faith writer, a, a secular writer, wrote this about the city of Athens, that you could find more gods in the city of Athens than you could find people. On one person's account from that time, there were over 30,000 gods and temples in the city of Athens. 
So if you were a religious person, boy, you had it good there. The problem was there was no religion that was actually true religion. Most of it was completely false. It was easier to find a God than a person. And there was a big temple called the Parthenon. You might've heard of it. Up on a hill in Athens. In fact, the ruins of that still stand there today. And it's magnificent and phenomenal and huge. And in that day, it was full, it was gold and it was, uh, it was marble and it was full of idols and it was full of idolatry. And that's what was going on in Athens. And Paul was distressed when he walked around the city to find out that there were so many idols with so much idolatry. This word distressed, it means provoked. Like there's a storm within you. Like you're, you're, you're worried and you're stressed out and, and there's something inside of you that just isn't working. And it's not because Paul was saying, oh, these idols, they offend me. Paul knew that idols were nothing, that they weren't going to offend him. I believe it's because Paul loved people like God loved people. And he knew when you walk into a city that's full of 30,000 idols, when people are worshiping every kind of God except for the God of the universe, you know two things about them. Number one, you know that they're at least open to the possibility that there is something outside of themselves to worship. There's a God outside of themselves. These people weren't necessarily atheists. These people weren't saying there's no such thing as God. Most of these people, many of them were saying there is some kind of God and we want to be worshiping that God. But the second thing that disturbed Paul was the fact that the enemy had so twisted the human desire to worship in a right way that there's now idolatry and people are worshiping demons and idols and it was distorting God's purposes for their lives. And so Paul is radically disturbed and provoked like he would have been in Philippi when that slave girl was following him full of um, demonic bondage saying, these men are servants of the most high. He turns around and says, get out of her because he wanted to see her free. And I believe that Paul was so disturbed about the idolatry in Athens because he wanted to see people free. Have you ever walked by something and just been disturbed in your spirit? You know that there's something wrong going on there. There's certain stores uh, in places that I shop that I, wa I walk by the front of the store and I just, my spirit is grieved. And I think that the thing that these people are approaching, there's something broken about that. I remember growing up, I, um, I used to drive on 99. Anybody ever drive on the 99 from Bakersfield to like Fresno? Okay, some of you are like, where's Bakersfield? What's, <laughs> what's Fresno? Well, we used to live in the Central Valley. We'd come down to visit family in Southern California and we would drive by this place. Um, it was this house kind of in the, on the middle of 99, in the middle of the San Joaquin Valley. And it was a, a, a palm reader. And it was this, this, I think it was a blue house. And this lady had this big palm and, and we would drive by the house. And every time we would drive by the house, my family who is all believers would, even as a little kid, I remember reaching my hand out and saying, Lord, close that place in the name of Jesus. Our spirits are disturbed, that place sitting there on 99. And I don't think that was a wrong response, but I think if it was Paul, Paul would have been driving by that house and saying, God, would you bring Jesus to this person in the name of Jesus? Lord, would you somehow bring salvation to this house? I, Paul was less interested in closing down the shops of the idolaters and the fortune tellers than he was in bringing freedom to the people that were stuck in that kind of life. And so as part of our engagement of culture, I believe instead of going to war against our culture, we need to be people who actually have conversations with our culture. And that brings us to the next verse. In um, verse 17, it says this. So Paul reasoned in the synagogue because he was greatly distressed to see the idols and the idolatry. Um, he reasoned in the synagogue with both the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. He reasoned in the synagogue in the marketplace. This word reason isn't about Paul being combative. Combative. How many of you, when you go to work, you know there's a bunch of non-Christians there. When you go to school, you know there's a bunch of people that don't know Jesus. And so you kind of you kind of gear up. You kind of put your armor on. You kind of, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to have a conversation today and I better be ready for it. I better be ready to answer anything that's asked of me. I better be ready to go to war. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like you think you're going into a battle and yet Paul didn't seem to be going into a battle. Now, Paul did say in another book that our battle is not against flesh and blood. He says, we do have a battle, but the battle against, isn't against people. It's against principalities and powers. 
There are demonic forces that we battle against every day in every situation, but we're not battling against people. And sometimes as Christians, we get it wrong. And we think people that we're going to engage, we better have it right so we can come out on top, so we can win the argument, so we can make sure that everybody understands what we have to say. This doesn't say that Paul went at at it with combat against people. It says he reasoned with them, which implies conversation which means I'm asking you a question and you're asking me a question and we're sitting down and we're actually reasoning through. And instead of shutting down the conversation, Paul actually encourages and cultivates conversation with people that don't understand how to live a free way of living. And it says that he did that in the synagogue and in the marketplace. By the way, that was Paul's MO all the time. Uh, If you read a couple of chapters later in um, um, Acts chapter 19 in the city of Ephesus, the city of Ephesus was surrounded the, the worship of this God that they say fell from heaven, like the idol they worship. The, the, the myth that comes along with that idol is that she fell from heaven and they set up a temple to her. And it was this great goddess that they all worshiped. And when Paul was preaching the gospel and an, a riot erupted in the city, they started accusing him and saying, hey, he's, he's gonna shut down our economy. He's gonna shut down our worship. And one of the city leaders who wasn't a Christian actually defended Paul. And here's what he said about Paul's message. Paul had been in Ephesus for months and months and months and months preaching every day. And this guy said, listen, Paul has neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. Paul has neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. Huh. So here's a guy who understood what following Jesus was about, who understood the dynamics of the kingdom of God, who understood the freedom that you find through the word of God. This guy would not come in and put down the goddess or the temple or the idols. He wasn't interested in destroying that. He was interested in helping people find freedom from that. He didn't have to destroy it in order to help invite people into freedom. And sometimes in our culture, we set it up as this war. It's us or them. Either their stuff has to be shot down and our stuff needs to be built up or we're going to lose and they're going to win or they're going to lose and we're going to win. And I want to tell you, that's not the way of Jesus. You don't have to tear somebody else's faith or somebody else's beliefs, even if they're not good beliefs, even if they're not true beliefs, even if they're not accurate beliefs. What we have to do, church, is invite people winsomely and graciously into the life that Jesus offers. And once they walk into that life, they're gonna let go of all the stuff that's been binding them. That's really important, okay? And so Paul is not trying to have, uh, pick a fight. He's actually trying to bring freedom to people. And so anyway, he did that in the synagogue, in the marketplace. And it says that he, he, he reasoned with anybody who happened to be there. And sometimes our strategy is, uh, is a little bit convoluted. We come up with strategies to reach certain parts of the city or to reach certain kinds of people, to reach people with certain jobs, or we want to reach influencers or we want to reach. And Paul, I'm not saying that we shouldn't want to reach specific people or have strategies, but I love Paul's strategy here. It says he just walked around the marketplace and in the synagogue and reasoned about his faith with anybody who happened to be there. Do you think sometimes the people that just happen to be in our lives are the very people that God put us in place to connect with? Some of you, you don't like where you live. You wish you could sell your house. You wish you could leave your apartment. You wish you could get your deposit back. You wish you could afford to live in a different neighborhood. I get all of that. I understand it. But have you ever thought for a moment that the place where you live right now is exactly the place where God wants you to live right now? Because... Because some of you are like, I just want to leave because my neighbor is the most annoying person on the face of the earth. I just want a better neighbor. Is it possible that God has you in the place he has you right now on purpose because your annoying neighbor needs Jesus? And your annoying neighbor needs to hear the light of God and the life of God. And God has put you there. So instead of trying to go, who else can I reach? Where else can I go? How can I go across the city and reach other people? It may be that somebody right next to you doesn't know Jesus and desperately needs to find freedom. And you're the person that can help express that. And I don't hear a lot of amens right now because because all of you are going, no, but I hate my neighbor. (laughs) The Bible says if you... Say you love God who you can't see, and yet you say you hate your neighbor who you can see. The Bible calls you a liar. I wouldn't say it, but the Bible says it. (laughs) Paul shows up and just talks with anybody who happens to be in front of him. Hey, let's keep going. Um, It says this in verse 18. Um, Hmm. (laughs) 
a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, Who, what is this babbler trying to say? And others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Okay, Epicurean philosophers. Uh, did I tell you already? I think I did. Athens is a, a hotbed of philosophy. Like for hundreds of years, that's where all the really important Greek philosophies were doing their work. They were, they were hanging out in Athens. In fact, at one point, we're going to read it in a few minutes, it says the Athenians did nothing except sit around talking about the latest ideas. They did nothing about sitting around, just hanging out and kind of like talking about what was going on. It sounds like the internet to me, right? Uh, it sounds like Twitter. They're, all you're doing is just talking about the latest ideas and, you know, it's Reddit or something. And you're just hanging, it's like a university town. It's like some of you, you know, working in knowledge uh, companies. You work for companies in the knowledge economy and I still can't figure out what you do. You just like sit around talking about stuff. I don't know. But it says Athens was like that. By the way, some of you still can't figure out what I do, so it's okay. Um, but, but it says that, that they were sitting around. And so the, these, these really important philosophers were there. Some of them were considered Epicureans. And Epicureans were people who actually were atheists. They only believed that the material world existed. They thought all these idols were stupid and ridiculous. And all these people worshiping the idols were crazy because they said, hey, all we have is what we have here. So you might as well pursue pleasure. And their, their theme, their cliche was, would have been something like, eat and drink for tomorrow we die. So party up, dudes, and uh, be excellent to each other. You know, uh, that, these are the Epicureans. They're the ones that just, they're just saying, hey, this is all about what's going on now. So be happy because you're going to die soon. The Stoics actually believed that God was everywhere. There wasn't just one God. There were thousands and thousands of God and all of those gods put together this moral code and you kind of had to line up with it because someday there would be some kind of reward. So right now, if anything bad happened to you, you just grin and bear it. And the Stoics also would say, if anything good happened to you, you just grin and bear it. Don't let anything like uh, 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 cultivate your passions. Try to keep it really, really solid and stoic. The Stoics and the Epicureans, and they get a hold of Paul and they start hearing his message. And I think it's really interesting that they're interested in what Paul has to say. They start debating with Paul. Paul didn't come debating, he's just reasoning with people. They start debating with Paul and they're interested in what he has to say. They don't just say, hey, leave it alone, dude. Well, your message is crazy. They go, this is interesting. This is new. This is something we haven't heard before. This is a message that we aren't used to. This is, you're, you're advocating foreign gods. This sounds really foreign to us. But it's interesting that they didn't just ignore Paul. They're actually interested in finding out more about what he has to say because it sounds so foreign to them. And the thing I would say, church, is this. And I told you this is going to be kind of a teaching this morning, not as much preaching. Um, but I want us to get a hold of this because it's a message that I believe is important for us today in our culture and how we engage with our culture. Um, it's, it's this. If we talk about the cross and resurrection, if we talk about Jesus and the way to God right now in our culture, even if people know who Jesus is, even if they have some religious background, even if they think they know what the cross is about, if we truly tell people about the cross and the resurrection in a language that they can truly understand and comprehend, I believe that for them it's going to sound foreign. Because church, it's good news. It's really good news that the God of the universe actually came as a human being and he grew up without sin and without the brokenness that you and I are subject to and without the rebellion that you and I have embraced and without the death that is alive in us, leading us toward our grave, all of us, the older we get, the closer we get to our grave, we're bound by death and brokenness and rebellion and what the Bible calls sin. And God came and he grew up as a perfect human being and he wasn't bound by death and he wasn't bound by rebellion or brokenness and he had no sin in him. So he died on the cross and when he died on the cross, he took your brokenness and your death and your sin and he nailed it to the cross. And he took the law that was written against us. When you read through all the Old Testament law and think, oh my goodness, I can't meet any of this. I must really be a sinner. And he took the code that was written against us and he nailed it to the cross and he buried it all in the ground. And when he rose from the dead, he offered you eternal resurrection life, not because of what you've done, but because of what he gave you. See, and when those of us who are bound and those of us who know that death is coming and whether we're the, like the Epicureans that go, well, hey, you've only got one life, YOLO, 
Um, you know, just, just go for it. Live, live your best life right now because it's all going to be done. You know people like that in your life. There's a lot of people in our culture like that. And then there's other people that are trying to do everything right because they think maybe at the end of, 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 of life, there's going to be these cosmic scales. And if you did enough good, then karma is going to be enough and you're going to get into whatever version of heaven they think exists. We know people who are Epicureans and we know people who are Stoics, but there's a third way, church. And that's the message of the cross. And when people really understand that, like deeply and truly, and it brings freedom, man, that's what it's all about. So here's Paul. He's not interested in destroying the Epicurean's argument or the Stoic's argument. He's interested in presenting a third way. He's interested in presenting the reality of Jesus. That it's not just some religion to add on to the 30,000 gods that exist. That it's actually a message that transcends all of the rest of it that actually can bring freedom. So he's advocating foreign gods, but they want to hear him because it's a message that resonates. Now in verse 19, it goes on to say this. Um, then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the uh, Areopagus, Areopagus, excuse me, a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we'd like to know what they mean. And it goes on to say, all of the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. The, the Aragapis um, is, uh, what it means is Mars Hill. The god Mars, the god, Greek god of war, uh, Mars Hill, it was his hill. And it stood there and it was where all of the important people came together. It's where all the thinkers came together. It's where all the influencers came together. And Paul's invited into the circle but we need to know this for a little bit later as I read Paul's sermon. He's standing on this hill, it's called Mars Hill, and it's in the shadow of a bigger hill that is the hill where the Parthenon is, is standing, where all of these idols and all of this worship is happening and this big temple is happening just up to the side. So this center of philosophy where everybody did nothing but talking and listening to the latest ideas is happening here. And this is where Paul starts his sermon. In verse 22, it says, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus. Uh, uh, I have a hard time with that word. Of the Areopagus and said, hey, don't judge me. You'll have a hard time with that word too. <laughs> Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I get it all right. The Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see in every way you are very religious. I see in every way you are very religious. Um, religious for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you today. Let me stop there. Paul starts his sermon. His, it's not really a sermon. It's a speech. They're listening to him. He's, they want to know more about this way. They want to know more about uh, the way of God, the way to freedom the way to life, this thing that Paul's been talking about that they're interested in hearing, they want to listen to him. So he starts with this. He says, I've walked around and I've looked carefully at your objects of worship. And the question I would have is, are we walking around the culture that God has put us in to influence carefully and looking at people's objects of worship? Do we understand the culture? Do we understand where people are coming from? Do we understand the art and the literature and the history and the myths and the things that are important to people? Are, are we clued into that? Or do we like just kind of getting together on our own and having an hour and a half of church a week and going, man, this is a safe space. I don't have to engage with culture. And then when we go back, we hide out in our homes. And when we go to work, we hide out in our Christian huddle. And we try very hard not to engage with anything in the culture because the culture is so bad. And I want us to understand that there are bad things in the culture that we live in. But I want you to hear me too. There are some good things in the culture that we live in. And for those of you, you know what? I feel like sitting down right now and talking to you. For those of you who only see bad in the culture, you're missing something really important. See, the Bible says that God has put eternity in all of our hearts. Every human being that's born, we're born into sin and brokenness, but we're also born with this seed of eternity in our hearts where we're reaching out for something real and something true. 
And a lot of times in our culture, there are some things culturally in, in our art, in our literature, in our poetry, in our films. There are obviously broken things there because they're made by broken people. But I also believe that we can find so many times redemptive connections to those things. You know why? Because eternity is in our hearts. People are reaching out to find and create things that connect to freedom and beauty and truth and love because eternity is in our heart. And when eternity is in your heart, you're looking for what is real and transcendent and eternal. And so we can look at culture. Paul's walking around the city and even though he's disturbed at the demonic idolatry, he's understanding people's heart cry for beauty and for what's true and for love and for freedom. And in a minute, we're going to read the rest of his sermon. He goes about connecting the dots, bringing the redemptive connections together and saying, this is what you're crying out for and you haven't known what it is that's going to satisfy your desire. But here's the desire. But we can't speak a message of freedom to people that are bound unless we understand something about where they're coming from. I really believe as we read this, we recognize the redemptive analogies that exist. The redemptive analogies that exist. They exist everywhere. You you can find them in in books. You can find them in poetry. You can find them in literature. You can even find them in movies. Did you know that? Nobody knew that? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. So um, I don't know if this is going to get me in trouble or or not, but I'm just going to do it anyway because I'm already not preaching my sermon, so (laughs) I might as well. Uh, Last week I took the boys to see the Batman. Um, some of you, some of you know what the Batman is and you're hoping to see it or you've seen it. Some of you are thinking, how could you go to that terrible movie, the Batman? And some of you have no idea what the Batman is. Um, it's a dark movie. Uh, I admit it. Uh, it is. But, um, if you know anything about the story of Bruce Wayne, which I don't think this is a spoiler because this story has been around for like 50 years. So if you haven't got it yet, that's too bad. Bruce, Bruce Wayne, Bruce Wayne, who is the Batman is, um, is destroyed and distraught and broken um, by a seemingly random violent event that happened in his childhood where both of his parents are killed. And he's the richest man. His family's the richest family in America, if not one of the richest families in the world. And he spends his life growing up, spending his considerable wealth and resources, turning himself into an instrument of vengeance because he hates the brokenness that's happening in his city. He hates the random violence that's happening. He hates the death that his parents didn't deserve. So he turns himself into one that can take vengeance upon anybody that does anything violent or bad in the city. And he starts walking around as vengeance and through the movie, he finds out that being the person who takes all of the revenge on himself, holding on to the offense and the bitterness and the unforgiveness actually doesn't just destroy him, but it actually extends the brokenness instead of fixing the brokenness until he finally realizes that he shouldn't just be embracing vengeance, but he should start trying to figure out how to help people that are messed up. Now, you, you, may, you may disagree about, you know, going to the Batman as a movie But as I sit and watch that redemptive analogy connection, to be able to talk to somebody about the reality of brokenness in our world and the desire for us to take vengeance on that brokenness and on broken people, but that God says in his word, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Vengeance is mine. I'm going to take care of that. I want to call you to be a helper, to be somebody that can go forward. Now, I don't know if the writers of Batman, the Batman, sorry, in this movie, it's called the Batman. I don't know if they're Christians. I don't know if the producers are Christians. I don't know if the directors are Christians, but I can look at something that was created, reaching out for something about beauty, something about truth, something that expresses love, something that expresses freedom. And I can say there is a God who embodies freedom and beauty and truth and love. There is a creator who created the universe, who takes your creative impulses and works through them. The reason you even have those creative impulses is because God gave them to you. You may not be expressing them in an aligned way, 
But instead of just ignoring them and saying, oh, they're not Christians. I can't listen to anything creative they're doing. I'm going to spend my life looking for moments, looking for threads, looking for seeds, looking for connections where somebody who doesn't know the Lord is expressing something creative that actually reflects the creator and then try to tie those things together so that people can find freedom in Jesus. I believe that's our call as Christians in a culture. Not to hide out from culture, not to say, oh, culture's bad. I can't listen, watch, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. I know, I understand that you've got to raise your kids the way that you feel like you need to raise your kids. And I'm not trying, every one of us has to wrestle through that. But for some of us who go, I'm not ever going to let my kid watch any movies until they're out of the house. By the way, if you try that, how many of you know that your kids, as soon as they're out of the house, are going to watch all the movies, yeah. right? <laughs> but what if as parents, we learned how to sit down with even our littler kids, and instead of just uncritically letting media flow over their lives, what if we were able to sit down and point out the redemptive connections in the creative things we're watching and point out where there's brokenness and point out where there's not brokenness and help our kids grow up to learn how to be not just unthinking um, purveyors of culture, but critical in the best ways of understanding what God might be saying through that. So again, back to teaching. I don't even know where I ended up now. I'm just, um, so he walks around and he looks at the objects of wor worship and he's looking for the redemptive analogies and, and here's what it says. It goes on to say this. Um, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. I already read that. But what we don't know about what Paul says here is Paul understands something about the history and the myth of Athens. 600 years before Paul gives this sermon on Mars Hill, a philosopher, poet, prophet, not a Christian or a Jew, not somebody who worshiped our, the God that we know, the God of the universe, uh, Epimen Epimenides. Epimenides, the poet, prophet, philosopher, is called into Athens because Athens is experiencing a great, um, a, 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 a great uh, 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 pestilence, a great, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, what's the thing we're in right now? A pandemic. Yeah, I, people are dying all over the place. And they call this guy and say, what should we do? And he says, do this. He's taking, he took a big flock of hundreds of sheep and he let them loose in the city. And he said, wherever these sheep stop and lie down, go find them lying there and sacrifice them to a God, but not to a God you know. Sacrifice them to a God you don't know. There's an unknown God that you're to sacrifice the sheep to and that will stop the disease. That will stop the pandemic. And according to myth, because even historians in the first century in Athens didn't believe that this really happened, but according to the myth, the people went and sacrificed the sheep and the pestilence stopped, the disease stopped. So all over the city were these places, these shrines that were built to an unknown God. And Paul shows up to say, hey, you've been worshiping an unknown God. You don't know who it is, but I want to tell you about this unknown God. Because in your myth, you had to sacrifice sheep to stop this disease from spreading. But in reality, Jesus came as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he was sacrificed. He, he, he decided to be sacrificed on his own. And when he did, he stopped the spread of sin and disease and death in your life. Paul takes what was a 600-year-old tradition and ties it to his message in a way that people would be able to understand that you and I couldn't understand today. But there are things that we can tie to the reality of our culture when we're talking about Jesus. And that's what he does here. He goes on to say this, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. Hey, this God who you worship as the unknown God, he's the Lord of heaven and earth. He's the Lord of all of this other stuff. And he doesn't live in temples built by human hands. It's one of my favorite uh, statements in this sermon because Paul's standing on Mars Hill looking at the greatest temple that was ever built full of thousands of gods, the ones that they were very, very, very proud of building this great temple. And he says, hey, that is beautiful, but God does not live in temple made by human hands. You put your idols in there and they live in there, but the God I'm talking about transcends even the most beautiful thing you've ever created. And he goes on to say, and he's not served by human hands as if he needs anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From the one man, he made all nations 
that they should inhabit the whole earth. And then he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would each seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. He doesn't live in temples built by human hands. Instead, he gives life and he sets up history so that people can find him. You guys, the enemy is at work in history to kill and steal and destroy. But even when the enemy's trying his best to bring destruction, God comes in and turns things around and brings life. Right, let me give you an example. We go, because this is, remember, this is what, this is what he's saying. Uh, boundaries and countries and nations aren't just man's idea. They were actually God's idea so that people could find God. So right now, I'll give you an example of what's going on. Right now, as we see the destruction that's happening in the Ukraine, in Ukraine and how uh, the Russian government, not the Russian people, but the Russian government is expressing that destruction and so many people are dying. It's horrible and I believe it's demonically inspired. At the same time, we're getting reports of Ukrainian churches and pastors and Christians that are stepping up to the plate and they are sacrificing their resources and even in some cases their lives to reach out to people and to save them and to help them and to give them resources. And we're finding hundreds and thousands of people that are turning to Jesus in the middle of this war. We are hearing about Christians and churches that are coming together in all of the countries that surround Ukraine. And when the first train stop happens, when people can ride on a train and get into Poland or get into these other nations and they stop in the first stop and they get out of the train, they're being met by churches with resources and places for people to live and diapers and strollers and food. And they're saying, let us help you because Jesus wants us to help you. God is working in the middle of all of this. And I pray, and I'm praying every day, I, am, I hope you're praying for a radical supernatural end to this war, like now. In fact, Jesus, in your name, we pray for a radical supernatural end to this war. Lord, just all of the plans, Lord, of Russia that we understand aren't just a man's plans, but they're even the enemy of our soul's plans to bring death and destruction. Just stymie that in the name of Jesus. Shut it down. Shut down communications. Shut down supplies. Shut down resources. Lord, turn the hearts of people that have been told to attack. Let them put down their guns and say, I'm not doing it. I'm not going in. We're not going to do this. Lord, stop this in the name of Jesus. We pray. And that's how we need to be praying with boldness. But Paul says this, hey, you think that all of, this, all of these nations are just people's ideas, but God's done everything, all of history. If you look at the word history, it's his story. It's his story. History is God's story. And just like culture and just like art, you can find a redemptive arc in history and find out where Jesus was working, where the Lord was working all along because he wants to bring people to salvation. So that's what happens there. Um, all right, let's keep, let's keep reading. It says that he gives life and he sets up history so we can find him. And then Paul goes on in verse 27 to quote uh, two, pro two uh, poets. He, he quotes their own, their own poets. And it says this, um, for in him we live and move and have our being, which by the way is the same poet uh, that was mentioned who brought this idea of letting the sheep go 600 years earlier. So this is a 600 year old line from a poem that everybody in the city would have known. And Paul uses it to express the gospel. And then he goes on to say, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. He keeps going. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. Here's what I think is really important and interesting about this. As Paul's talking about the reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus, as Paul's getting ready to talk about repentance and turning from your own way, he uses two lines from, a secular po from two secular poets to help bring his point across because it's a language they understand. It's poetry they understand. It's culture they understand. It's something that's gonna grab a hold of them and they're gonna go, oh, I've heard that one before. Yeah, I've heard that. I know that song. I know those lyrics. 
Okay, what are you saying? How does that have to do with what I need to believe about God? And this is even more interesting. He goes on to say, listen, it's not about your skill in developing and building idols that's going to bring God to you. But I think it's interesting that Paul doesn't say, hey, you idol builders are terrible, horrible people. You're demonized people. You need to get on your knees and repent right now. He actually says, hey, you know what? You're pretty skilled. You actually do these, those, those idols, boy, they're, that's a lot of skill there that you used. You, you really, you've got a lot of skill. You're a pretty good artist. But I need to let you know that the thing that you're wasting your skill on isn't going to bring freedom. In fact, it's going to bring bondage. That's a different kind of attitude than coming against the world, warring and saying nothing that line, if, if it doesn't line up with what I think or with what, what I believe, I'm going to discount you as a person. Paul is trying to engage people where they're living, where they are, where their jobs are, where their poetry is, where their art is, where their skill is. And instead of putting it down, he actually uses it to bring them into a conversation about following Jesus. And I think that if we're going to learn how to engage our world where it is, because by the way, Jesus engaged us where we were. He didn't sit up in heaven and go, hey, all of you idiots down there, figure out how to be really good like me and, and you come up to me and, and then I'll accept you. That's what religion says. If you get good enough, God can accept you. Jesus says this. It's about relationship with him and he didn't ask us to become good enough for him. He became like us and he surrendered himself to become like us in every way yet without sin. And I think when we're called to engage culture, that we're called to engage a culture in every way we can as long as it's without sin. That we're not called to enter into the brokenness, but we're called to understand it. Anyway, Paul goes on in verse 28. I want to read the rest of this to you before we're done. He says this, um, Therefore, since we're God's offspring, we shouldn't think that uh, the divine being is like silver or gold or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. There is repentance that's needed. We live in a world that's broken and messed up and dead and we got to turn around from our ways and we got to repent and start going Jesus' way. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And when they heard about the resurrection from the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And at that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. All right, let me end this way. I just want to talk about for us a few things that we can learn from this. And the first one is this. We're called to know God's word and our identity in Christ first. Say first with me. First. first. Here's the thing. Sometimes, sometimes people go, well, I want to engage culture, so I need to understand culture. I need to understand all the movies and all the literature and all this stuff and everything else that's out there and all the pop culture. And I want to understand that really well so I can engage it. But they still don't know the word of God. They don't understand their identity in Christ. And so what you're doing is you're putting people in a situation where they're going, wait a minute, do I believe the Bible or do I believe culture? We're not suggesting that. We're suggesting that when you go to engage culture as a believer, that you start out with a foundation in Jesus that is unshakable. Does that make sense? So you know the Bible, you know the word, you know God's heart for you, you know God's heart for people, you understand who you are in Christ as you go to engage culture. The second is this, is that we're to get God's heart for people wherever we are. That we're not there to fight against people or to shut down individuals or to say what you're doing is terrible. That we're there because God loves them so much and we're to say, how are they reaching out for truth? And we can say, oh, I know the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. How are they reaching out for beauty? And we can say, we know the creator of the world who created all beauty. How are they reaching out for freedom? And we can say, Jesus died on the cross to bring you freedom so you would never have to be bound again. How are they reaching out for love and God says, I am love. I, I'm not fighting against people. I'm looking for the places where they are hungry to experience the reality of God. And so I need to then understand what they're reaching out for and how, which means that I look at the things that they're creating and the ways that they're expressing that. And I learn to embrace anything in our art or culture that doesn't dishonor God 
And I look to understand even those things that may not line up with God so that I can help people find the life that they're looking for. Don Carson, who's a theologian, talks about 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul says he becomes like a Jew to win the Jews and like a Gentile to win the Gentiles. And when he exegetes the passage, he explains it this way. And I read this from Tim Keller, who points this out from Don Carson. And Micah, can you come up? And we're going we're gonna to finish with this. This is what Don Carson says. When in the last century, Hudson Taylor, the founder of the China Inland Mission, now which is the Overseas Missionary Fellowship, started to wear his hair long and braided like the Chinese men of the time and to put on their clothes and eat their food, many of his fellow missionaries derided him. So it was over 100 years ago. And this guy, Hudson Taylor, goes to China to share the gospel. But the problem is before that, anybody who had gone over to share the gospel in China looked like a Westerner, dressed like a Westerner, ate like a Westerner. And somehow the message of the gospel got wrapped up in the message of cultural Westernism. That in order to become a Christian, somehow you figured, oh, I've got to become like this person. I got to wear suits like this person. I've got to eat like this person. I got to cut my hair like this person. And Hudson Taylor said, I don't think so. And he started doing what they were doing culturally, trying to figure out how to read their culture, how to understand their art, how to truly understand not just their spoken language, but their heart language, how to understand everything that they were doing. Hudson Taylor had thought through what was essential to the gospel and therefore non-negotiable and what was a cultural form that was neither here nor there and might in fact be an unnecessary barrier to the effective proclamation of the gospel. This is not to say that all cultural elements are morally neutral. Far from it. Every culture has good and bad elements in it. Yet in every culture, it is important for the evangelist, the church planter, and the witnessing Christian to flex as far as possible. I'm going to add like Jesus did. So that the gospel will not be made to appear unnecessarily alien at the merely cultural level. You guys, can we learn how to connect the dots? Um, some of you work in the entertainment industry. I, we got writers in our church that are writing things that you would go, I mean, it's not anti-Christian, but you'd never think like, oh, that's Christian. But they're looking for opportunities to connect dots. We have people that work in schools and you're finding things from kids and there are opportunities to connect dots. There are conversations that you can have with your neighbors and there are opportunities to connect dots. You may be working in business or government and there are opportunities to connect dots. There are opportunities to find ways of redemptive analogies that people would understand who Jesus is, that we would be able to speak about redemption and restoration and Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. And I'm not suggesting that we don't talk about those things and just kind of make it all fuzzy and kind of talk about art and hopefully people connect the dots. People, church, I think we have to connect the dots. But can we start in a place where people are and then lead them to the reality of the gospel instead of starting where we are and hoping that they're going to find their way there? It's our responsibility to say, how can I figure out what you're thinking what your language is, how you understand redemption. And now how can I help bridge that gap to bring you to Jesus? That's the message that's been knocking around in my heart for a couple of weeks. Like I said, I didn't put it together as a sermon, but I needed to share it because I think God's calling us to something and I want to pray for us. Lord, I really believe that you're calling us. Mm. I believe that you're calling us to a missionary mindset. And while if I called everybody a missionary in here, half, half of the people would get scared and run out because people are afraid of being missionaries. The reality is that when we're Christians, Lord, we're called not just to minister to one another, but to care so much about the lost, to have a deep passion for the lost, that we would bend over backwards and do anything but sin. Lord, that we're not gonna ever do anything that misaligns with your intent for our lives. But as we submit to you, we also learn how to help engage people in places where they can understand. Holy Spirit, would you challenge us this week to be people 
who make those cultural connections to those analogies, those redemptive analogies, to help be people who start to connect dots for people, that help pull people along in a way that helps them find you, Jesus, that we would look at the art around us and the culture around us and find places where people are reaching out to you. And yes, even find places where the enemy's twisted it and find ways to communicate. Hey, this is twisted and broken and it's not gonna help you find the thing that you're really looking for, which is life and love and freedom and truth. Lord, I pray that you'd give us the ability, Lord, to engage our culture that way. We love you, Jesus. We worship you. We worship you. Just let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. I I don't know what the Lord might have been saying to you today, what he might be encouraging you or challenging you toward. My guess is there are some things that you said amen to and were excited about. There's other things that might have been challenging for you to hear. Just just take it to the Lord and and maybe even after today, go home and and, and look through the word. Be like the people of Berea who, who examined the word to see if what the pastor was saying was true. Lord, would you change our hearts? Lord, I just, I feel inspired to pray this. Because maybe there were people that heard what I said and and maybe they're suspicious or maybe they're not sure if it's accurate and they need to go and research the scriptures to see. Lord, I, I get that. I get that people may be challenged. But Lord, regardless of the challenge of what was said specifically, would you give our church a passion for the lost? Lord, would you give us a passion for people that are lost and dying without you? Would you give us a passion for people who don't know you and aren't walking in freedom? Would you give us a passion to help people be saved from an eternity in hell without you? God, give us a passion for the lost that we would want to find them for you at any cost, at any cost. Give us a passion for the lost. Give us a passion for the lost, Lord. Can you pray that with me? Say those words. Give us a passion for the lost. Give us a passion for the lost, Lord. Oh God, give us a passion for the lost. Lord, we were lost, but you found us. We were broken, but you healed us, Lord, and you're taking us toward healing and wholeness. Give us a passion for those people in our lives who desperately need you, God. Lord, whatever it takes, that we would lay our lives down, lay our preferences down. Lord, lay ourselves down. We would sacrifice our lives for the lost. Jesus. Would you keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed right now with me? And if you don't know Jesus and you need to find him, he's been looking for you. He knows where you are and maybe you've been hiding from him. Maybe you've been denying him. Maybe you've said, no, I want to do it my way, but doing it your way, you know, has embraced all kinds of death and destruction. And Jesus, I said earlier, died on a cross for you. He took your death and destruction and he buried it in the ground. And now he offers you resurrection life that goes forever after you die, but it starts right now. And if you want to say yes to that resurrection life today, maybe for the first time, or maybe you would say, you know, I followed Jesus as a religion, but I'm ready to really have a right and real relationship with him. And you would say, that's me. I'm coming back to Jesus for real today. Would you just put your hand up and say, I want to follow Jesus today for the first time, or I'm coming back to him. Yeah, I agree with you. Anybody else? Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, you and you. Is there anybody else here? You'd say, that's me. Yeah, right back here. I agree with you. Anybody over here to my right, your left? Yeah, I see you and agree with you. Amen. Anybody else? You'd say, that's me. Wave at me if I've missed you. Let's say, I want to follow Jesus for real right now. I want to come to him for the first time or again. I see you right there. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, right up here. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jesus, for what you're doing. Thanks for all of those who are watching online that would say yes to you. Lord, for any of us who have said yes to you or want to turn to you, I pray that you would be real in our lives, that you would take our sin and take it away, that you would fill us up with your cleansing power. God, that you would give us eternal life right now as we trust you, as we turn to you, as we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. Amen. Hey, next week, I'm gonna talk about grief. I want you to be here. I want you to bring anybody who might be dealing with grief. I think it's gonna be a powerful time. God bless you. Good day. Let's applaud what the Lord is doing in this place.